What does it mean for a function to be continuous at a point? As you probably remember from calculus, the idea should be that a function is continuous at a point c if the limit of the function as x approaches c equals the function's value at that point. And now that we've rigorously defined what the limit of a function even is in terms of epsilons and deltas, link in the description to my lesson on that, we can finally arrive at a rigorous formulation of the definition of continuity, and it's called the epsilon delta definition. Today, we'll go over the epsilon delta definition of continuity, we'll talk about a few equivalent characterizations of continuity, and we will, of course, do an epsilon delta continuity proof. There are chapters in the description if you want to skip around the video. Also check the description for links to my videos on functional limits. If you understand functional limits, that makes this a whole lot easier. Here it is, the definition of continuity. Keep in mind as we read this, this is the definition of continuity at a point. A function f from a set a of real numbers to the real numbers is continuous at a point c in the domain a if for all epsilon greater than zero there exists some delta greater than zero such that for all x in the domain where x is within delta of c we have that the distance between f of x and f of c is less than epsilon. This should look very similar to the definition of a functional limit, since that's pretty much what it is. So we could say f is continuous at c if the limit of f of x as x approaches c equals f of c. This is saying the same exact thing as this, provided that c is a limit point of the domain, since if c isn't a limit point of the domain, we can't even have x approach c, so this limit statement would not make sense in that case. The main definition does not require c to be a limit point of the domain. You'll see later that if c isn't a limit point, the case is very simple. So that's our definition, and if c is a limit point, we can state the definition simply in terms of a limit statement, and we say that if f is continuous at every point in its domain, we simply call the function continuous. Again, all of this should seem very familiar if you understand the limit of a function. This is a picture that I used in my lesson on that topic, but it also applies here. What we see is that as long as we can get x sufficiently close to this point c, then the function will be within a certain distance of its value at c. And as we get closer and closer to c, the function will get closer and closer to its value at c. That's what it means for it to be continuous. Again, epsilon is basically a tolerance for how far we'll allow the function to get from f of c. And we're trying to find a delta so that as long as x is within delta of c, f of x will be within the allowed tolerance. That's the idea of arguing that a function is continuous at a point. A couple of comments regarding this definition. We don't require that the absolute value of x minus c is greater than zero, like we did in the definition of a functional limit, because c is an element of the domain. So it's totally fine if x equals c. When we define functional limits, we can take a limit at a point that isn't in the domain. So we did want to guarantee that the distance between x and c was positive, since x equals c might not make sense in the definition of a functional limit. But for continuity, there's no problem, because c is an element of the domain, so it's totally fine if x equals c. We don't need to specify that this distance is positive. It's fine if it isn't. And then coming back to the limit point issue, again, this definition does not require that c is a limit point of the domain. The definition of a functional limit did require that because you can't have x approaching c in the domain if c isn't a limit point. For continuity, it's fine if c is not a limit point. If c is not a limit point of the domain, f is guaranteed to be continuous at c, so it's pretty trivial. This is because if c is not a limit point of the domain, there will sort of be this empty space around c where you cannot get that close to c within the domain except at x equals c. This means as long as we require x to be within that space, 
it being in the domain forces it to equal c. That's the only option, which of course would imply that f of x minus f of c is certainly less than epsilon because it would have to equal zero because the only valid x value in this situation is c itself. Once more, if c is not a limit point of f, f is guaranteed to be continuous at c because you'll be able to get sufficiently close to c so that being in the domain in the function at all forces x to be c, thus forcing the distance between f of x and f of c to be zero. So the epsilon delta definition of continuity is not that bad, but it's not all we've got. Here are four characterizations of continuity. These are all equivalent with the exception that the last one is only equivalent to the others when c is a limit point of a. Again, because the limit statement doesn't make sense unless c is a limit point of the domain. This first one is just the definition that we went over. The second one you might call the topological or neighborhood definition, which is the standard rephrasing of the inequalities into neighborhood notation. It says that f will be continuous at c if for all epsilon neighborhoods of f of c, there exists a delta neighborhood of C so that X being in that delta neighborhood and the domain implies that F of X is in that epsilon neighborhood of F of C. The last one again is just the limit definition. As long as C is a limit point of A, this definition is equivalent to the others that F is continuous at C if the limit of F of X as X approaches C equals f of c. These three are really all just packaging the exact same definition in slightly different notation. The epsilons and deltas from the original definition really just come from the definition of a functional limit. The topological definition is just writing the same stuff but with neighborhood notation. The third definition, however, is meaningfully different from the others. This is a sequential definition which can be particularly useful to prove that a function is not continuous at a point. I'll leave a link in the description to the lesson where we prove that the sequential definition is an equivalent definition of continuity. It really just comes from the fact that we can define functional limits with sequences as well, which we've done previously. But what this definition states is that f is continuous at c if for all sequences xn converging to c, that are in the domain of the function, it follows that the sequence of images of those xn terms under the function f converges to f of c. So this means if we can find a function converging to c, but where the sequence of images f of xn doesn't converge to f of c, that is sufficient to prove that a function is not continuous at C, and we don't even have to deal with epsilons and deltas necessarily. So these are the four characterizations of continuity we have in our tool belt, but the big one you're probably here for is the epsilon delta definition. So let's finish with an example of proving that a function is continuous using the epsilon delta definition. We'll do a nice and easy example proving that the identity function f of x equals x is continuous on its entire domain, which is the real numbers. To begin a continuity proof, we take an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero, and then since we're proving it's continuous on its entire domain, we'll take an arbitrary element from the domain, so just a point c in the reals. This proof is sufficiently simple that we don't really have to do any scratch work ahead of time. We'll set delta equal to whatever value works out. We'll see what value works out once we do another line. The idea is that we'll pick the correct delta, and then we'll have that for all x that are within delta of this real number c, we have that the distance between f of x and f of c is, well, by definition of the function, it's equal to x minus c. And this is less than delta. So what should we set delta equal to? Well, obviously, we should set delta equal to epsilon because that gives us that the distance between f of x and f of c is less than epsilon. And that's the whole proof. That proves that f of x equals x is continuous on its entire domain. At any real number c, for any epsilon greater than zero, as long as you are within epsilon of c, the function's values will be within epsilon of f of c.
And we can actually take that result a pretty long ways thanks to these handy laws about continuity. Link in the description to the lesson where we prove these familiar properties. These statements are assuming that f and g are continuous at c and the domain is a. So if you multiply a continuous function by a constant, you're still going to have it being continuous at c. The sum of continuous functions at c is continuous at c and so on. So since we know that f of x equals x is continuous on its whole domain, for example, we could take x times x and say that's continuous at its whole domain. We could take x times x, which is x squared, and add it to x and say that's continuous on its whole domain. Using these properties, we could actually show that every polynomial is continuous. Just because we know that these things are true, and we know that f of x equals x is continuous. Property 4 also guarantees us that rational functions, the quotients of polynomials, are continuous wherever they are defined. So these basic properties, along with this itsy bitsy proof, actually does quite a lot of work. Again, link in the description to my lesson actually proving these properties. Finally, here's an exercise for you to try. Prove that f of x equals the square root of x is continuous. The domain, of course, is the non-negative reals. This isn't that hard, but it's definitely harder than the one we did together. If you want a hint, here is a hint. First, take care of c equals 0. Then, you can focus on the positive numbers where you're going to want to use a conjugate. Link in the description to my lesson proving this, as well as several other continuity proofs. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. I really hope you found this video helpful, and if you did, please consider supporting Wrath of Math on Patreon. Link in the description, it's a huge help. Thanks for watching.